Hello everyone, it is a pleasure to welcome you all once again to MSP lecture series on interpretive spectroscopy. In my last lecture, I showed you how very nicely we can use phosphorus NMR uh, to monitor a reaction and also we can gauge when the reaction is going to end and also whether any products are formed or not other than the expected product. So, now let us continue looking into more such examples of course, using several other NMR active nuclei as well. Now, let us look into 19F NMR and of course, about the abundance, gyromagnetic ratio all those things I have given in the beginning. So, now let us focus our attention to the chemical shift values as far as 19F NMR is concerned. 19F is 100 percent abundant and I equals half. Again, it is as simple as 1HR 31P to measure and understand. So, here if you just look into CF here, when we have something like this on a alkane chain, reference we are using is CFCl3. So, relative to trifluoroacetic acid, so it will show around minus 131 or with respect to fluorobenzene, monofluorobenzene it comes around minus 96 but with respect to CFCl3 it comes at minus 210. Different references are used that is the reason I have given the value relative to different standards. And then in case of two fluoro groups present on same carbon, we see a peak at minus 140 in case of CFCl3 and minus 69 with trifluoroacetic acid and minus 26 here. In fluoro aromatic compounds the range is minus 140 or minus 60 or minus 26. And then in case of fluorine atoms present next to carbonyl group, the ranges are minus 125 or minus 46 or minus 11. And again, we have a CF3 group next to a CH minus 75, 4 or 39. And then a CF3 group next to carbonyl group would appear at minus 81 or minus 2 or 33. And if you have a sulfonate group, it comes at minus 50 or 129 or 164. These are some of the important ones. Besides that, we have numerous compounds. So, for example, if somebody asks you to sketch the 19F NMR spectrum of CLF3, simply by looking into valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, you should be able to arrive at the right kind of geometry for CLF3. And then again, uh, let us recall your uh, basic understanding of VSEPR theory. So, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, the abbreviation is self explanatory. And now, if you just look into the valence electrons present on chlorine and fluorine atoms, we are talking about 7 plus 3 here. So, 10 electrons are there. 10 electrons means steric number equals 5 are there. And in case of 5 here, 3 bonded pairs are there and 2 lone pairs are there. So, the preferred geometry for steric number 5 is trigonal bipyramidal and then when you have trigonal bipyramidal with the 3 bonded pairs and 2 lone pairs, all these possibilities are there and then we have to look into lone pair, lone pair, lone pair, bond pair and bond pair, bond pair repulsion and from this basic knowledge, we will arrive at the rice structure where we have 2 lone pairs in the plane and then 1 fluorine atom also in the plane equatorial and other 2 fluorine atoms being axial. So, this is the right structure and also we say that it has a T shape. And then we have to sketch the 19F NMR spectrum of this one here. And assuming this molecule is static, we can anticipate two type of fluorine signals. Uh, one is due to axial one, other one is due to equatorial one. Equatorial one will be coupled with the two axial ones to give a triplet and then two axial will be coupled with the equatorial one to give a doublet. The spectrum should be a doublet and a triplet, something like this. So, this is how the 19F NMR spectrum of CLF3 looks like. So, now let us look into another interesting molecule. Again, some of these molecules are really meant for explaining VSCPR theory, SF4. Very interesting to look into the shapes of the molecules or species and also the geometry. 
and you should remember the difference between the shape of a molecule and geometry of a molecule. When we define the geometry of a molecule like this, we have to consider both lone pairs and bonded pairs. That means the entire steric number has to be considered while defining the geometry, but while defining the shape, we can ignore the lone pairs. And that one should remember. Sketch the 19F NMR spectrum of SF4. Of course, SF4 also same thing. If you look into SF4, we have six electrons are here on sulfur, S2P4, and we have four electrons coming. So we have 10 electrons are there, and steric number is five. And here, four bonded pairs are there, and one lone pair is there. So that means again trigonal bipyramidal geometry. With trigonal bipyramidal geometry, what basically happens is one something like this. If S is here, what we have is one fluorine here, one fluorine here, and lone pair is there. So lone pair will be occupying, and then this is a trigonal bipyramidal molecule but the shape is seesaw shape and also to minimize these repulsions what happens they are further bent little bit in this fashion so it is this fashion so that means here we have just by simply looking into the molecule we can say that there are two types of fluorine environments are there and two axial ones and two equatorial ones. So when we look into the signals we anticipate two type of signals and each signal will be a triplet. So that means we can see presence of two triplets for SF4 here. So it should be something like this. This is a two triplets are there, one for so axial, one for equatorial. And then this is FF coupling. The spacing what we see here or here, it is FF coupling. So this is how we can sketch the 19F NMR spectrum of SF4. Let us look into another molecule here. Now we have taken SCF4. You know that 77 selenium is NMR active with I equals half and it is only about 7.6 percent present, rest 78 is NMR inactive. So when we look into 19F NMR, we can see again very similar to uh, SF4, it has a seesaw type structure. So with color I can distinguish them. If you look into 19F NMR, again we are seeing a triplet in each case. Of course, in each case triplet is there and again because of selenium being NMR active that is present in 7.6 percent or so, what happens we can see satellite peaks. That means basically if you see a triplet something like this. So let me make it little bigger. Now we can see this coupling will also have this will give you 1J FSC coupling. And then what you see here is this spacing is J FF coupling. 1, 2 J coupling. So same thing happens in both the cases. Both the cases we get a triplet of a triplet and also a triplet of doublets that would be here. So this happens in both the cases. But when we look into 77 selenium NMR, 77 selenium NMR, what basically happens is you get a triplet. First this is coupled with axial ones and then each one will be split further into triplet into equatorial ones. So if I plot this one, it should be 1 is to so 1 is to 2 is to 1. So this is how we can sketch both 19F NMR spectrum as well as 77 NMR spectrum for SEF4. So you can see here triplet of triplet. It is pretty easy, right? So now let us look into another example here, SIF4. SIF4 is a tetrahedral molecule and if you look into fluorine NMR, this is fluorine NMR. Fluorine NMR would not show much difference because all fluorine are in a single environment and if it is 
tetrahedral molecule here. But you should remember the fact that silicon has three isotopes, 28 silicon, 29 silicon and 30 silicon and then 28 silicon is 92.23 percent, 29 is 4.67 and this is 3.10, 30 is. And now this is I equals 0 this i equals half and then again this i equals 0. So, that means basically we should think of a signal coming here without involving any coupling in case of 19 f this corresponds to 92 means 95.33 which is an MR inactive i equals 0 okay. and this one whatever we are seeing is 1J 29 to silicon coupling that is about 178 hertz and if you look into intensity this corresponds to 2.32 and 2.32 or something like that. So, this is how this again satellite peaks, but if you look into 29 silicon NMR. So, you can see here then it looks all fluorine atoms being identical all four fluorine atoms would split silicon signal into a pentate a quintet we do not use the term pentad for 5, we use the term quintet. So, we have 1 is to 4 is to 6 is to 4 is to 1, we are getting something like this. And here again, if you look into the coupling, the magnitude of this one should be same as this one. So, we again double verification we can do. So, silicon NMR looks like this 29 silicon NMR for SIF 4 would be a quintet. You see now how simple it is to look into various other NMR active nuclei other than 1H and 13C and also 31P. Let us focus our attention to two more NMR active nuclei that is nitrogen 14N and 15N. The 14N NMR experiment is much less sensitive than 1H, but has a much larger chemical shift range and signals are broadened due to quadrupolar interaction of 14N having I equals 1. So, the larger the molecule and the more symmetric the nitrogen environment, the broader the signal. This one should remember if running 14N or 15N is inevitable, 15N there should not be any problem, but if you have when you are running 14N, what we should remember is the larger the molecule and the more symmetric the nitrogen environment, the broader the signal. The small and highly symmetric aqueous uh, ammonium ion gives a very sharp line less than 1 hertz wide. So, that means if the molecules larger and more asymmetric around the nitrogen environment, the broader it will be the signal. And small and highly symmetric aqueous ammonium ion gives a sharp line with less than 1 hertz width line width. So, on the other hand if you look into liquid ammonia being less symmetric here the width is 16 hertz on a 400 megahertz spectrometer at room temperature. And urea is larger and asymmetric, so the line width is approximately 1 kilohertz you see very broad signal. So, molecules that are significantly larger than urea yield signals too broad to be observed with a high resolution NMR spectrometer. Even with a 600 it is very difficult to observe. Since the nitrogen chemical shift range is wide may be readily used for distinguishing nitrogen species in very small molecules. And if you want to run 15N uh, it has to be preferably enriched otherwise the percentage is so low it is very difficult. You can see how much percentage is there. So, for example, natural abundance of 14N is 99.63 and chemical shift range is 900 ppm from 0 to 900 ppm and frequency ratio is also given for ammonia and reference compound is nitromethane in CdCl3 and line width of reference is 19 hertz and T1 relaxation time is also given and then all this vital information is given and one should keep these things in mind especially when you want to run 14N. And of course, 15N is very, very important from biological point of view because we have a lot of nitrogen compounds. Now, as I mentioned, if the molecule is more asymmetric, the line width will be more. You can see here the spectrum of urea, it is very huge. And then if you see here NH3 in liquid very small and less symmetric. So, 16 hertz is there and then if you see NH4 plus very small and highly symmetric, you can see the line width is 0.8. It looks like 13 CNMR or phosphorus NMR. 
very simple. So, that means, if you have a smaller molecules and symmetric looking into 14 nnmr would be rather easy. So, this plot essentially to show how the line width varies with the molecule symmetry and also the size. So, now this is one inch annual spectrum of ammonium chloride. This is a tetrahedral molecule, you can see it is NH4 plus, and then these four protons are identical and they are coupled with nitrogen, nitrogen I equals 1. So, you see a triplet of equal intensity 1 is to 1 is to 1 here, and then the coupling is 1J. 14 n to hydrogen coupling is 52.4 hertz. So, what is interesting is in this one we are also seeing very very tiny peaks here. This is due to 15 n less than 0.4 percent or something. This is about 1 j 15 n H coupling is 73.5 hertz. Probably uh, they have taken much longer time to identify these uh, two peaks here. This is the 15 n satellites here this was observed in case of ammonium chloride. You know that 14 n coupling constant is smaller compared to 15 n coupling because 15 n lower resonance frequency. Now, if we look into 14 n NMR spectrum of ammonium chloride, now 14 n this nitrogen is uh, equally coupled to 4 equivalent hydrogen atoms. As a result what happens? It shows a quintet of this type. So, 14 n NMR spectrum of ammonium chloride consists of quintet, whereas 1 H NMR spectrum of ammonium chloride is consists of a triplet of equal intensity 1 is to 1 is to 1 line. And of course, this also you can say it is a AX4 spin system. Look into this molecule here, 15 N enriched cyclosporine A in CDCL3. This spectrum was acquired in one hour, very interesting. We got a beautiful spectrum for this. 15 n because it is a 15 n enriched molecule here. Still it took 1 hour for acquiring the entire data to identify all these 1 to 11 uh, nitrogen atoms here. To obtain similar sensitivity without enriching would take about 10 years. That means, basically we have to take this sample put into NMR spectrometer maybe 600 megahertz or something run continuously for 10 years. Run 15 n NMR for 10 years continuously without stopping to see something like this. So, you can imagine the presence of 15 n so low and then how much sample is needed and how much time it takes. But on the other hand, when you enrich this one with 15 n, it appears like any other simple molecules and measuring 1 H NMR, beautiful spectrum is there. You can see all 15 n are here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. In biological studies, 15 n plays a very, very major role. So, now this one is for sodium azide. Uh, sodium azide, of course, you have two different types of nitrogen atoms are there. One is cationic and the other two are anionic and of sodium is there. So, sodium plus, so it is neutral. And then the middle one is appearing here and these two anionic are appearing here and the ratio is uh, 1 is to 2 here. So, this is a 15 n enriched sodium aside taken in T2. So, let me show you another very interesting example. Uh, this is about 13 C NMR. The structure of tertiary butyl lithium is very similar to that of methyl lithium. We know that methyl lithium has a cubane structure where alternate corners are occupied by methyl group and lithium with four lithium atoms having tetrahedral relationship, but with each hydrogen atom replaced by a methyl group. Uh, in case of methyl, you get tertiary butyl lithium, that is it. So, in methyl, we have three hydrogen atoms are there. If you replace each one with a methyl group, we end up with tertiary butyl lithium that also has very similar structure to that of methyl lithium, cubane structure. The 75 megahertz 13 C NMR spectrum of a sample of T butyl lithium prepared from 6 lithium metal consists of two signals, one for the methyl carbons and one for the quaternary carbon atom. That means, if you look into 13 C NMR spectrum, we get uh, two signal sets. One is for quaternary carbon directly interacting with uh, lithium, other one is methyl groups. So, now, if you focus our attention to the quaternary carbon, the spectrum look like what I have shown here. Uh, at 185 Kelvin, that is at low temperature, it shows seven lines here. A typical septet 
On the other hand, at 299 Kelvin, that is at room temperature, it shows 9 lines. So now we have to analyze and explain. So why at lower temperature 13 C NMR spectrum for quaternary carbon shows a separate, whereas at uh, room temperature R299 Kelvin, it shows a multiplet having nine lines. Now let us look into the cubane structure. This is how you can show the relationship of four lithium atoms in methyl lithium or tributyl lithium. This is a tetrameric. And then uh, in each phase, we have a carbon is sitting like this. It is a methyl or tributyl group. And that means at 185 Kelvin, what happens? And this the molecule is very static. When it is very static, this carbon present in one of the uh, triangular faces would see only three lithium atoms. It is seeing only three lithium atoms because the whole molecule uh, has no flexionality and it is very static and it, it is sitting something like this overlapping with orbitals of 2s orbitals of uh, uh, 3 uh, lithium atoms and it is a 4 centered 2 electron bond system. So in this case what happens? It identifies all equally that means the carbon is split by 3 equivalent lithium atoms. If we use 2Ni plus 1 rule at lower temperature. We have 3 and I equals 1 plus 1 it shows 7 lines, so 7 lines. So this is carbon in 1. But when you look into room temperature, what happens? It is no longer static. So all lithium atoms are exchanging. As a result, what happens? Carbon sees four equivalent lithium atoms. Okay, all four they will be exchanging. Uh, as a result, what happens? You will see this carbon see okay observes are in contact with four equivalent lithium atoms now. So if four equivalent lithium atoms are there at 299 Kelvin. So what would happen is if you use again 2Ni plus 1 rule, we have 4 identical 1, I equals 1. So it is 9 lines. So we will see 9 lines here. Okay. So that this is how even uh, the dynamic process can be understood readily using NMR spectroscopy. So let me continue in my next uh, lecture more details and more examples. Thank you.